Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. No matter where you are watching this presentation, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today and provide you an update regarding surface preparation standards uh, for concrete from uh, SSPC, the Society for Protective Coatings, and NACE International. In addition to that, I'd like to talk about other industry-related uh, standards, uh, test methods, and also guidance documents that work in conjunction with standards from SSBC NACE. Um, and then also talk a little bit about the general aspects of concrete related to surface preparation. Before I start, I'd like to well, uh, thank uh, the Coatings and Corrosions eShow um, organizers for allowing me this opportunity to have a discussion with you today. My name is Jim Kunkel. I'm a protective coating specialist and I work for SSPC, the Society for Protective Coatings. So when we talk about surface preparation of any substrate, it is really the most critical element of a coating project. Approximately 80% of coating failures, premature failures and failures are attributed to not proper surface preparation or improper surface preparation. So the whole aspect of surface prep is very critical for the success of a, a project. And it doesn't matter the type of substrate that you're working on. If the surface prep isn't done properly, the coating, the painting system can have problems and there can be failures, which could be catastrophic or actually cause a lot of a damage to infrastructure. Concrete is a very different um, material in that with steel, you can overblast steel and sometimes have no real um, long lasting effect or problems. With concrete, a little bit more precision really needs to be in place to be able to um, blast and do surface preparation of concrete. So the better the surface preparation, the longer the coating system life. In this presentation, I'll focus on really on the concrete uh, surface preparation itself. Now, before we do any type of prep, we really want to evaluate the existing concrete. If it's an ex a, um, already construction that's due for a project, or if it's brand new concrete, we really want to do an evaluation. And what evaluation will be consisting of is a visual report, and you really want to map out any type of problem areas, irregularities, where you might have challenges with the concrete, maybe you have some um, other um, uh, infrastructure items tied into the concrete, but you also want to make sure that it is clean and sound. That's very important to have clean and sound concrete. So, you know, each area of your assessment, you're going to grade it as to whether if there's a need for repair. Uh, this is prior to it, but then also when you do your surface preparation, you're going to be able to go back and relook at those areas that had repair issues to see ex exactly how far of an extent of repair you need to do in those areas of concern. So some of the irregularities to, um, to, to concrete can be things such as um, we have voids or you have, which would be honeycombs. You might have spalling where you have some, you know, uh, concrete splatter, other types of buildup where it's not really strong and it's weak. Um, latency is another issue sometimes. You can see these two photographs here. You have exposed rebar because the concrete has popped off and that can be a major, major problem when it comes to corrosion within the structure itself, within the concrete itself. It doesn't matter if it's horizontal or if it's vertical concrete. Now there's different ways to test for um, uh, the soundness of the concrete. And as it shows here on this slide, it talks about a chain drag method, a DeLam 2000 and a Schmidt hammer. So there's different ways to get there. Some inspectors will use screwdrivers where they tap the concrete. They might use a hammer, you know, a regular construction hammer. But the, a lot of times you have these um, other types of test methods. This is not a martial arts uh, device here. This is a chain drag where you would drag this on, on a horizontal concrete surface. And you're going to listen to sound differences, differences in sounds. And that should help you identify where there might be areas where there's hollow areas. And that obviously when you go and you blast it, those are areas that could pop up. But also you want to make sure that 
you do reassess those after you do your surface prep. Now a DLAM 2000 tool that's here, you can see it's a metal wheel and you roll it. This is typically used a lot of times on concrete walls, columns, um, uh, ceiling areas where you'll roll it. And again, you're gonna be listening for any type of sound issues. And you wanna make sure you mark those areas you catalog those in or document them in, photograph those areas so that you can, after the surface prep, you can go back and reassess those areas. Now, a Schmidt hammer is used where, as an inspection tool, it's going to give you the hardness. So this is something you would use to check the hardness of a surface area and get readings. It's, it's When we think of the PA2 for coating uh, inspection, where you're doing spot checks, look at this as a kind of that type of a, a function where you're actually checking the hardness um, based on air surface area. Now, surface contamination can really be multiple things. Um, it could be anything from dirt, oil, grease, um, chemicals. Maybe you have storage of some uh, processing chemicals, um, existing incompatible coatings as well. So typically, most of the construction you have with concrete is in buildings. Uh, it is in infrastructure, such as in transportation systems. But it's also in water treatment, wastewater, um, different types of uh, concrete pipelines that are used to move um, wastewater material and other types of uh, storm runoff and everything like that. So those environments, when we talk about a wastewater facility, you know, they have a strong opportunity for really a lot of these type of um, challenges when it comes to the surface contamination. And when we look at conducting a test, ASTM has a, has a different types of test methodologies that are used in conjunction with the SSPC NACE uh, standards when it comes to the surface preparation of concrete. But most common is a water break test where you're basically going to take droplets of water or um, through a spray bottle or an eyedropper and you're just going to check to see how it, fl it flows on the concrete. Is it get absorbed into the concrete? Does it flow like there is a slick layer, let's say of grease or oil? some type of contamination. These are quick, easy methods to test. Another methodology is a black light where you would have a hood or a shroud that goes over and you just use the black light looking for any type of areas that would stand out. They would literally glow out at you where you'd be able to see there's some type of a grease oil, oil buildup or maybe there's a sealer on this particular concrete and it's only in certain areas because it's worn off. But when we look at surface preparation, we're really talking about cleaning it or creating a profile. And so when we look at it, there are different methodologies to clean the um, concrete, but also to surface prep it as, as well. And we will cover some of those methodologies as well. Now, this is the listing of current SSPC NACE uh, standards and ASTM test methods and the um, International Concrete Repair Institute uh, guide guidelines that tie into these particular standards. One uh, particular concrete standard has been around for a very long time, roughly, I think since 1997, is the um, SP13-6 surface preparation of concrete. It's very heavily specified in a lot of projects um, work and specifications related to concrete surface prep. And it really kind of is a, um, a general standard, let's say, that talks about the need, the importance of it, but also talks about methodologies related to surface preparation. Um, if you're gonna use anything, you know, from flame spray to, you know, slurry blasting, to wet abrasive blasting, to abrasive blasting, um, or even just general cleaning itself. So this standard has been around for a number of years, like I said, and it's very heavily specified. In addition to that, to kind of help fortify that related to the abrasive blast cleaning aspect of concrete prep, in December of 2019, SSPC, um, uh, through roughly about almost a three and a half year process, came up with the concrete abrasive blast standards. Now, when SSPC develops standards um, in the same for NACE as well, uh, we really look at what is the industry telling us globally they need and secondly, does this stuff already exist out there? So you're not going to find the standards um, that are going to be a competitive standard um, unless the industry wants something that's more narrow or a little bit more defined that might, what might be out there. And so the CAB um, covers three different aspects of it. 
a thorough blast, which would be a little bit more um, heavily uh, labor work related to blasting, an intermediate um, blast, and then a, a, just a simple brush blast as well. But in conjunction to that, it also works with ASTM standards out there, the, the 4258, which deals with the surface cleaning of the concrete, um, again, um, or concrete for coating. Um, it's a very uh, a journalist type of, uh, of a uh, standard out there. But then also too, in addition to that, it can go with the 4259, which deals with the standard practice for abrading concrete as well. And many of you who work in the concrete industry, um, you might be familiar with the um, ICRI guidelines. And what this is, this guideline is a, a, a a book that's put together regarding of the surface profile that you would want to have. In addition to that, um, there are 10 um, what they call CSP chips that are used in conjunction to provide a visual comparator after the surface prep is done. And then looking at what does the coating manufacturer require the CSP range to be for a particular concrete coating in an environment that you're looking to apply it on. So these standards from NACE and SSPC do work in conjunction, not only with each other, but also with the general industry uh, standards out there and guides as well. So as I mentioned earlier, the SP13A6 really deals with, um, you know, the, the basic elements of, you know, why preparation of concrete really needs to be done. And then it's also, it's a, it applies to any type of uh, cementitious surfaces. Um, and uh, this is something, again, that's heavily specified. Now, with the concrete abrasive blast standards, as I had mentioned earlier, this is a very good chart to refer to and get a better understanding of the differences when it comes to concrete abrasive blast standard from SSPC. With a thorough blast, you're going to, well, for all of them, really, you're, for all of them, yes, you're going to want to remove any unsound surface. That's loose concrete. That's air, it's, it's uh, areas that are really challenging when it comes to concrete. Um, you also want to make sure that efflorescence, um, which is a material that kind of leaches out of the concrete, and latence, which, which is weak areas as well. Those want to be removed through all of those different blast methods when it comes to the CABs. Now, when it comes to the uh, air voids that you might have under concrete, so under concrete, you'll have, you could have the surface area and you might have underneath some void areas, some openings. So with the thorough blast, you wanna fully open those. You wanna make sure that those are totally open and uh, that, you know, obviously they are marked and, and if they need to be uh, repaired, in most cases they will. Um, but when it comes to intermediate blast cleaning and the brush blast cleaning, it's not really required to open those up. For existing coatings, you do want to remove all the coatings through the thorough blast, but you can also, for the intermediate, leave um, some of the coatings uh, still there. Um, but for the brush blast, you want to remove all the loose, uh, loose coatings that are on there. So the notes, as you can see, the thorough blast cleaning is going to be very, very robust. It's full removal and uniform profiling of the surface. For the intermediate blast cleaning, you want to remove all existing coatings except for that remaining surface air voids and uniform profiling of the surface. And then for brush blast cleaning, uniform profiling of the surface. So again, you have three different le levels of uh, cleaning when it comes to abrasive blast. ASTM 4258, I do like to talk about it because you know this is dealing with the really the cleaning of, of concrete prior to coating but it's not intended to be um, a standard that would give you a profile. And it just covers, you know, removing all the grease, the dirt and other materials, you know, by broom cleaning where you're kind of scrubbing, a vacuum cleaning, light air cleaning, maybe using some detergents, water, just using uh, water and jetting it, and then steam cleaning um, as well. So this again, like I say, works in very good conjunction with SP13 A6 and it's you know, typically uh, utilized when it comes through the inspection process or in the requirements for the contractor as well in the project specifications and documentation for the project. Now, uh, ASTM D4259, um, it does deal with abrading the concrete, but it really covers about surface cleaning to remove materials and, and to profile the concrete itself through mechanical cleaning, you know, water jetting, abrasive blasting, um, acid cleaning and etching, 
And I'll show you a, a photograph later in the presentation regarding, you know, the acid cleaning. Acid cleaning is really a, a last step. Um, you really um, don't want to do that unless you have to do it. So just keep that in mind as well. Now, as I mentioned also earlier about the, 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 uh, the CSP chips, the profilers, that deals with the um, International Concrete Repair Institute, the ICRI guideline 310.2. Um, this is heavily used by contractors, by um, also by inspectors as well. And this will provide you the surface preparation as being completed. And this will give you a visual comparator when you're looking at what coating system you're applying, what CSP, what profile does it need to have in order for this uh, coating to be applied onto the surface. Um, and this is a different type of proling, profiling techniques in order from increasing, uh, increasing the profile height. You know, and it covers all the way from detergent scrubbing down to milling and rotor, rotor milling as well. But you can see a lot of the, the terminology that's used related to concrete from um, scabbling, from you know, steel shot to scarifying, um, needle scaling as well. These are the techniques that are used in concrete for surface preparation. And then this is the, the chips themselves. Um, these are, uh, like I say, heavily used by uh, the contractor and by the inspector as well. So when we talk about dry abrasive blast cleaning, there's three general methods involved. Um, you can have conventional open air driven. Um, you can use a vacuum collection air driven, which is basically as you're doing the surface prep, the vacuum, it's got a vacuum system to it where it's pulling the dust. You know, silica obviously is a, a very major concern by breathing in uh, silicone dust. Uh, if you don't have proper PPE or you don't have other methods like this when it comes to uh, vacuum collection, um, the worker, the craft worker can be exposed uh, to uh, silica which can cause silicosis, which is a respiratory, um, uh, respiratory disease that can impact the worker over time. Um, in addition to that, uh, when it comes to general methods, you also have shot blasting as well. Um, so there's different ways to bring technology and equipment uh, to doing dry abrasive blast cleaning. Now, before you would do any type of, um, uh, you know, basically abrasive blasting on a concrete when you have obviously air driving the abrasive material, you need to test the compressor's cleanliness when it comes to the air. And a very good test method is a blotter test where you're taking the, um, basically the, the fabric, the blotter fabric, um, that can be purchased uh, from a lot of different companies. And you're basically going to blow for a period of time that um, air, compressed air. There is an ASTM test method related to that, the D4285. And what you're looking for is the presence of oil and water in the compressed air. Because what happens is that can create a contamination or you could be putting moisture into the uh, concrete substrate that you're working on. So you really wanna make sure that that air is clean and dry um, because of contamination and other challenges and damage, um, damages that could happen as a result of uh, it being not clean and not dry. For wet abrasive blasting, which is, is commonly used um, more today than ever, that really does control dust from the conventional air blasting. And there's different um, methodologies when it comes to equipment setups. Um, it can be anything from radial water injection to a coaxial water injection. Um, it could be slurry where you know it's coming out as a slurry out of the nozzle or, or water brazing with the abrasive injection. So there's different types of technology that are used globally when it comes to wet abrasive blasting. And uh, SSPC has a technical report called the TR2, um, which is also a NACE document as well. And that deals with wet abrasive blast cleaning. Um, I highly recommend look into that um, related to abrasive uh, blast cleaning. When you're talking about acid cleaning, um, and then you also have etching. So, a lot of consumer projects and light residential, um, let's say light industrial projects, sometimes they require uh, the concrete to be etched before a, a painting system or type of a sealer might be put down on it. We want to talk more about the acid cleaning related to surface prep. And this is really to try to get off any types of um, grease, um, other materials that might be on there 
um, that might obviously be like a, an oil based or, or some uh, type of um, you know animal fats, animal grease, stuff like that. So what you're basically doing is you're you're cleaning um, you're cleaning the concrete, and um, you know there's different methods. It can be a, a liquid acid or it could be a gel, and you want to make sure that there is a minimum age of at least six weeks before you do any type of acid etching. But when it comes to cleaning um, with acid on concrete, as it says here in the red, most coating manufacturers um, they really look at this as a last resort, you know, when other types of cleaning methods are very impossible. And what you want to do is when you're using any type of acids for cleaning concrete, especially in these industrial or these food processing or any type of um, application like that, that you not only do the acid cleaning, but you also um, go back and do cleaning with water to uh, neutralize, to remove that acid material as well, because again, that can cause a challenge with the coating system if it's still present uh, on the concrete or um, just below the surface. There are different types of acids. I won't go through that. Um, and then also too, there are other methodologies that you can use that are safer uh, to acids where you're, you're using you know, muriatic uh, acids, some a citric acids that are biodegradable. Um, so again, there are some environmentally compliant, there's some safer, safer methodologies. You know, when you're cleaning with acid, the craft worker also becomes very potentially, um, you know, it's a safety concern because of respiratory um, and also for skin protection, eye protection. So again, that this is kind of extreme when you want to use acid because it, it's very, can be very damaging, very dangerous to work with. And also when you're dealing with the environmental aspect and the cleanup as well. This is a photograph here of um, acid being done on a containment area. And you can see at the forefront of the photo before the person, the craft workers uh, boots are there, you can see in the corner, um, the bubbling action is the acid itself, you know, removing, it's eating up, it's pulling up all the acids or I'm sorry, all the um, uh, fatty material um, oils, or it could be pulling up the grease that might be here in this containment area itself. Flame cleaning is done um, where you're basically using flame to be able to remove the coatings and things like that. But it can also be used to remove oil and grease. Now, when you're also dealing with flame, you run the risk of having explosive pop-outs because again, you have these air voids that you might have underneath the surface of concrete. As that heats up, it could pop out and knock blow concrete out on you. But also too, when you're using heat, it can produce micro cracking and concrete, which can become problematic. Um, sometimes it might not be, but there is a higher degree of a potential of problems that could arise as you have micro cracking in the concrete with a coating system over top of it. Now moisture testing. Moisture is very critical uh, to test for. And typically when you're doing a slab or you're doing some type of a vertical structure, when you're doing uh, testing, it is a kind of a snapshot at that moment. And typically to get a trend of, mo of moisture in concrete, you need to do it over a longer period. But as everybody on this, uh, this uh, in the issue might already know, with projects, you don't have a long time to be able to do longer test methods uh, before you do the actual coating on the concrete. So you really, concrete is very, um, it's more like a living material in a way. Uh, it has water, it does have moisture that flows through it. It's just to determine exactly how much moisture potentially, and then is there a potential risk based on what your findings are for coating failure because of you know, moisture coming from behind um, the coating system. And you wanna work really tight with your coating manufacturer to really, once you have findings and, and information, to be able to see what potential issues there could be, or maybe no issues at all. Now, sources, sources, I'm sorry, sources of moisture can be inherent into the concrete. Um, it could be outside of the concrete. So, for if you're dealing with a slab or a wall that is on the ground or in the ground, there could be water that's on the other side of the concrete that could be um, pressing up against the concrete you typically will have moisture already in the concrete itself, but then you might have external sources. For example, when you're looking at wastewater, where you have the water that's being uh, treated 
uh, to turn it back either uh, to go back into the environment or maybe in some cases it's going back into potable water to be able to be consumed. You know, you want to make sure you do test for it. But as it says here on the slide, you know, excessive moisture can cause premature um, uh, failings. It can cause issues regarding, um, you know, pop outs and you know, curling of the coating. Um, there's ASTM methods to test for moisture and concrete. And you really want to perform these after the surface preparation is complete, you know, before the coating is applied. So, you know, you're looking at testing for moisture and obviously you're doing the repairs that need to be done before the coating application. So ASTM has a couple of test methods, the D4263, which basically is a, a what they call the plastic sheet method, where you take a, a square piece of plastic sheet, you tape it down, let's say you come back next day and you see the amount of moisture condensation that might be underneath of the, that would be underneath of the, uh, uh, of the plastic sheet. And that can give you a kind of a determination. Obviously, if there's excessive moisture underneath of it, then you might have a, a little bit of a concern, a little bit of a challenge. Um, uh, the uh, other ASTM method is the um, F1869, where you're basically using um, calcium chloride. And how the calcium chloride test works is that you have a container of calcium chloride. You weigh it prior to putting it in the area that you want to test. Then you would take the calcium chloride, um, it has an opening on the top that allows the moisture and the air and the, uh, the atmosphere to kind of interact with the calcium chloride. But then you put down a plastic container, tape it down, come back after a predetermined amount of time. And then you want to take off the cover and then reweigh the calcium chloride container and see what the weight difference is. And that can give you a very good indication of exactly um, what range of moisture you're dealing with. Um, again, these test methods are really just a snapshot in time. Another method that's used a lot in inspection is the F2170, where you're using basically probes, where you would drill down into the slab or into the wall and test uh, the moisture using electronic digital methods. Um, these are heavily used a lot today. Um, they are very good at getting a very good uh, definition of exactly moisture. Um, it can be a little bit faster for you because you're able to move and, and, and then be able to get multiple readings relatively in a shorter period of time versus uh, test methods where you have to come back a day or come back after a predetermined amount of uh, hours, let's say, for the test. Great photograph here to show you exactly um, what concrete looks like. So you, when you're looking at concrete, think of, you know, we have, you know, capillaries, you know, we have veins in our bodies. Concrete, typically, when you're looking at, it's going to have the same type of a, of a functionality where you have a lot of space, some voids, you're going to have moisture, it's going to be flowing in the slab or in the wall. And then when it comes down to it is you're trying to determine exactly how much water, uh, or sorry, moisture um, potentially is in the slab or in the wall that could cause a problem with the coating system itself. Um, Moisture in concrete is uh, typically about nine to twelve percent. So when you really think about it, like I say, well, there is a fair amount of moisture in it, and uh, it's you know vapor moisture vapor can be emitted below grade, on grade, above grade. You know bare concrete floors. Um, this is a, the probe where the probe is in the uh, in the slab here itself. You can take a look at that photo there, and um, that's the presentation I have for you today. And I really do appreciate the opportunity. And again, I wanna thank the uh, Corrosion and Coating Z Show organizers for allowing me to have this conversation with you today.